God, we come before you humbly and we worship you in this place, God. We lift your name on high. For you are great and you are greatly to be praised, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would come and you would rest your spirit heavy in this place, Lord. For it is you we've come to seek. It is you we've come to spend time with this morning, Lord. Our hearts are open before you, God. Come and spend time with us this morning. It's in Jesus' mighty holy name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and join us? You guys know this one. I'm training. And I'm training my sorrows. And I'm training my shame. And I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. And I'm training my sickness. And I'm training my pain. And I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I'm pressed but not crushed. I am pressed but not crushed. Persecuted, not abandoned. I'm struck down, but I'm not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for His promise will endure. This joy is gonna be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, this joy comes in the morning. Oh, and I'm training my sorrows, and I'm training my shame, and I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm training my sickness, oh, and I'm training my sickness. I'm training my pain, and I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Let's lay it down. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Let's sing it again. Yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Oh, I am pressed, but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned. I'm struck down, but I'm not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for His promise will endure. That His joy is gonna be my strength. And though the sorrow may last for the this joy comes in the morning, oh, and I'm training my sorrows, and I'm training my shame, and I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord, oh, and I'm training my sickness, and I'm training my pain, and I'm laying them down. Training my sorrows, and I'm training my shame. I'm laying down for the joy of the Lord. I'm training my sickness, and I'm training my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Oh, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Yes, God, we lay it all down before you this morning, Lord. 
Lord, we sing a song of praise to you in this place. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we know that no matter what we go through, we can count on you. Lord, you make a way when there is no way. You're that light in the darkness, God. Lord, we can hang on to you, Lord. to see beyond and everything I've known and with your strength I'll stand it's all I can do I will lift my hands and sing my way through so when I'm broken at my weakest in my darkest hour I'll let my worship be a weapon on this battleground and from the depths of the lowest place I will give you the highest praise, the highest praise I will give you praise I'm hanging on I am hanging on to every word you speak. I can see beyond into the victory. Lord, you never left. Lord, you never change. All my confidence in Jesus' name. of the lowest place I will give you the highest praise the highest praise I will give you the highest praise the highest praise because the cross put My song echoes through an empty grave Because the cross put the enemy to shame Come on, sing it out Now my song echoes through an empty grave Because the cross put the enemy to shame Now my song echoes through an empty grave my weakest in my darkest hour I'll let my worship be a weapon on this battleground and from the depths of the lowest place I will give you the highest praise the highest praise so when I'm broken at my weakest in my darkest hour I'll let my worship of the lowest place I will give you the highest praise the highest praise I will give you the highest praise the highest praise because the cross put the enemy to shame now my song echoes through an empty grave because the cross put me the shame. Come on. Now my song echoes through an empty grave because the cross put the enemy to shame. Now my song echoes through an empty grave because the cross put the enemy to shame. Now my song echoes
goes through an empty grave. Keep singing that because the cross put the enemy to shame. Now my song echoes through an empty grave. Lord, we worship you, God. Lord, let our praise you, glorify you in this place, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we want to be right where you are. Let your spirit fall. Stir it up in our hearts, God.
you came to my rescue and I wanna be where you are I wanna be where you are oh, I call and you answer and you came to my rescue and I
when I don't feel that you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Stop working, you never stop working. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, we make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yes, that is who you are.
worship you. I worship you. I worship you. All right, one book, one church. If you got the newsletter, um, we're going to move to Titus. And yes, I know we were in Titus about a month ago. Just felt like we needed to go back to Titus again. So we're going to go back to Titus again. Something There's something really cool that's happening. Um, as, as we've read through the letters to Timothy, uh, the timing of Titus interconnecting with what happened with Timothy, this is all, it's all working together as Paul's life is, is reaching its zenith. And so I, it just seems so good to me to do that. So we'll be in Titus again, again very short book. We won't be here long, but it just seemed right to me. Uh, Wednesday night prayer, 7 to 8, here at the church. I want to encourage you to come and be part of that. And then Friday prayer, uh, Bonnie leads that here at the church. That's from 1 to about 2. Pray for the town, pray for revival. Uh, and also, there are just a whole bunch of different Zoom prayer meetings throughout the week. And I, I know I kind of beat those to death, but I really would like you to know what's available for you. And so what we've been doing the last couple of weeks is inviting uh, whoever's leading those prayer meetings to come up and share a little bit about what's going on. So Joseph shared with us last week. And uh, the next meeting is Bonnie's. That's on Tuesday night. And I'm not going to ask her to come up because it's I don't want to complicate her life. <laughs> she, she, of course. But I do want you to know what happens. So Joseph's meeting, it's a short meeting. Bonnie's meeting's a long meeting. It runs about an hour-ish. Correct me if I'm wrong here anywhere along the process. It runs about an hour. And, and this is learning to pray effective prayers. And so the idea here, this is, a, this is kind of a, a place to learn how to pray. And so um, sometimes uh, the Lord will give her some direction. There'll be an assignment, find some scriptures to pray over people for Tuesday night. There'll be different things for you to do. This is more of an active type of learning how to pray. If, if you feel uncomfortable praying in a group, that would be a good, a good prayer meeting to become part of. Uh, Joseph's prayer meeting is what we call a closed meeting. So that means that Joseph prays, and the people who log in typically just agree with him. I, there might be people who pray, but typically he does the praying and people just agree. If you don't, if you don't like to pray out loud, his is a good meeting. If you don't like to pray out loud, Bonnie's meeting probably will be a little uncomfortable. But that's okay because that's where you learn to pray. So I want to encourage you, if, if you're not comfortable with prayer or, or you just go, you know, we, we talked Wednesday night about how we, we begin to pray the word and people are going, whoa, yeah, I'm beginning to understand this. Well, that's what Bonnie's teaching people in her prayer time, how to pray the word. You understand his word in his mouth is powerful. His word in your mouth is also powerful because his word doesn't return to him void. And yet much of the churches they're praying they're not really praying his word. They're praying a brief synopsis of a message they heard three weeks ago that really is not at all what his word says. You, you begin to invoke the name, things happen. You begin to invoke the word, things happen. So we need to learn how to do that. Also, uh, every day at noon, uh, set your alarms on your phones. I kind of like around noon here, all these alarms are going off. That means people are doing it. Um, we pray in tongues for one minute every day at noon. If you don't pray in tongues, pray in English. One minute. This whole last week, I prayed in English again. That's okay. Don't. There's no. I don't want you to feel like there's rules. It's like, well, I can't do that because I don't pray in tongues. I, just pray. Just pray one whole minute. That's all it is. One minute every day. But see, what's happening is we're gathering together in different places, and we're beginning to take a stand in the heavenlies. I hope you can see that. Also, the prayer team will be here for you uh, after church. So if you have needs, if you have family members that have needs, if you're concerned about 
whatever. Come and ask them to join their faith with yours. Don's exercise class, Monday and Wednesday at 10. Uh, the ministry classes will continue this Tuesday and Thursday. They're at 7 p.m. For those of you who are doing those, we'll be on question seven. Uh, we ordered more soccer balls because Grandma Mike sold more than we had. And now she's already sold all those too. And they haven't even arrived yet. So four weeks? Four weeks. Uh, let's see, Women's Bible Study, that's going to be Monday the 26th, Kelly Carlson is leading that. If you have any questions, you can get with her and she can tell you what's going on. This is uh, Unexpected Strength When Disappointment Leaves You Shattered. Um, so I want to encourage you to get with her. Um, if you need books, all that stuff, you can point them in the right direction. Praise the Lord. Boy, there's a lot of announcements. There's more announcements every day, I think. All right, for those of you who are interested, at 2 p.m. our time today, Laura Trump is going to be holding a, uh, a call to prayer, and that'll be on Facebook. And so just go to Facebook and uh, uh, Donald Trump's website, and you'll find the thing there. That's today, our time, uh, at 2 p.m., so 5 Eastern time. Finally, the, the information you've all been patiently waiting for and desirous, I'm sure. Um, I told you I felt like the, we were going to have a time of fasting coming up. I, I, want to, uh, I want to do that the 23rd through the 25th. That's a Friday through a Sunday. Um, remember Daniel, he had three weapons that he employed that changed the course of the nation. He prayed, he fasted. And he repented. Um, it's going to be the 23rd through the 25th. That's this Friday through this Sunday. Um, I'm not a legalistic type person. I'm not saying you just have to fast all food for three whole days. What I am saying is you get together with the Lord and you... See, fasting is humbling yourself before Him. It's just a recognition of, of my position and his position. And what I want to do is I want to humble myself before him. In Daniel's fast, he just ate vegetables. Okay, for me, that's a terrible strain. I'd rather just, <laughs> rather just not eat at all. But that, that was his fast. So, you know, sometimes, sometimes people choose to fast different things. Um, you know, I, I, I've known people that will fast the internet or they'll fast television or they'll fast... Listen, it doesn't matter. What we're doing is humbling ourselves before the Lord, right? You don't have to do it all day. You may say, you know what, I'm just going to fast breakfast those days. Now, if you already fast breakfast, okay, that doesn't really count. Do you understand? Again, I'm not trying to be legalistic, but as the election approaches, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I just, I hope you can understand this. There is one created being out of everything God created that has the weapon. That's mankind. There's only one. So we have, we, it's just, this is our hour. Praise the Lord. All right, I won't beat that up anymore. All right, let's turn to John chapter 1. Let's prepare to take the tithes and offerings. Uh, the basket's over here in the corner now. Don't forget you can give online if that is the thing that you like to do. I'm still surprised by that. Praise the Lord. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Now, if you're reading this in your Bible, you'll notice that's a capital W. Word's capitalized. That means it's a proper noun. Proper noun means it's a person. It's a, it's not a wide encompassing thing like, uh, you know, I might say the earth. In this case, the word is a proper noun meaning it's a person. So in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Some translations say the darkness has not understood it. And I think in fairness, um, how do you understand it? You know, if, if you think about it, the Holy Spirit indwells us. Most of us don't understand it. Anyway, in the beginning, before time began, at the very outset of everything, God created the world that you and I now see. Everything that we see, he put together. It was the supernatural that created the natural. And because of that, it's, it's not possible for the natural to ignore the laws of the supernatural. So if you understand what I'm saying, it, the, the natural was born of the supernatural. It, it came out of it. And because it came out of it, it will forever be bound to it. The natural is always bound. It's always subject to the supernatural. Your, your kids, if you don't have kids, your parents are, are inexpressibly bound to you in, in some way because a piece of you flows through them. A piece of you is in your parents. I used to, used to hate the way my dad would say certain things. Make me nuts. Crazy. When I have kids, I am never going to talk to my kids like that. When I have kids, I'm never going to say that. But what do you do? You say it. And it's coming out of your mouth, and you're going, unbelievable. Here it is. And it's right. And see, what's happening, what's happening is you are inexpressibly bound to them because you are from them. They, they flow through you. Now, Genesis 8.22, we read of the law of seed time and harvest. You can look that up on your own time. What you need to recognize is that law of seed time and harvest was not born of the natural. It was born of the supernatural. When the supernatural created all things, God put within everything, each, each animal, each plant, he put within it the seed to reproduce and to multiply. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I plant a kernel of corn in the ground, I don't get a kernel of corn back. I get a stalk, which has many ears of corn, and each ear of corn has many kernels on it. That is the nature of seed time and harvest. And because it's a spiritual law, because it was born of the supernatural, it can't be changed. You, you can't modify it. You can't, you can't change it. And furthermore, you can't mock it. You know, you can't. You can, you can pretend it doesn't work, but it's always going to work. Whatsoever a man sows, that he shall reap. It's always that way. Plant corn and don't expect anything but corn to come up. You're going you're to get beets or lettuce or cabbage or it gives birth in like kind. Now, sometimes people say to me, you know, it's like I've sowed and I just don't, I just don't see it. I just don't see the harvest coming. I, I'm, I'm ready to reap, but I don't see it. What I want to encourage you with today is simply this. God is not mocked. This law is not mocked. It always produces. It can't help but produce. Whatever you sow, you will reap because it's not a natural law. It's a spiritual law. And even if nature gets in the way of it, somehow slows it down, it's still going to produce. All these wild, wild fires that are destroying all these trees, you watch in a few years, the black will turn green. It just will. I, Got a friend, and they were they were trying to make bread, and they kept saying, "You know, man, we can't we can't find yeast anywhere. We're just looking everywhere for yeast." It's like, dude, it's in the air. It's everywhere. See, in the beginning was the Word. The word was with God, and the Word was God. It is this Word that binds the entire universe together. 
And, and don't think of it as an initial fixing of something. You know, it's like I'm going to build a table, I pound the legs in, and now it's done. This is an ongoing binding. It is by his word he is continually binding the word together. If his word fails, everything fails. If his word fails, everything comes undone. I just, I want you to understand, even if it tarries, wait for it. Just hang out a few minutes. Because it cannot be mocked. It cannot be stopped. It, even, even if the harvest looks a little bit behind. You know, God's timeline is just different than mine. You know, I want it today. He's not so interested in today. Behold, I come quickly. That was 2,000 years ago. His timeline is different than mine. But he cannot be mocked. And so I want you to not get frustrated. And above all, I don't want you to uproot and doubt something you planted in faith. You understand what I mean? You planted it in faith. You were full of faith when you, when you put it in the ground. And now a passage of time has gone by and you're upset because you haven't seen your harvest. Now you start, start speaking bad things over it and you start uprooting everything you planted. Relax. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. It's not possible to change that. It might not be in your time, but it will happen. can't help but happen. And if it fails, everything else fails with it. Father, I bless your people today. Father, where there is lack in this house, Father, where there is insufficiency in this house, Father, I condemn it according to your word in Jesus' name. Father, I speak life over this people, and I speak increase over this people in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you would increase them and increase their children as well. Father, I pray that they would have all sufficiency in all things, that they could be a blessing on every occasion. Father, I pray that their house would be full. Father, I thank you that you go before us and you make a way for us where no way would otherwise exist. Father, for that we thank you. And we humble ourselves before you in Jesus' name. Amen. What if I told you we were on the precipice of a great change? We were, we were on the edge of a great change. We were on the edge of a great revival breaking out. And it, and it wasn't like in this ether somewhere in the next 50 years, but in the next weeks or maybe even months. But if I told you it was a great transfer of wealth that was about to happen. Selah. Hallelujah. All right, let's turn. Man, I'm out of time already. Yikes. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Now, I kind of get a kick out of friends sometimes and say, man, have you heard so-and-so talk about this? Have you heard so-and-so talk about this? Man, did you hear this guy talk about this? So I'm thinking, you ever heard Paul talk about it? Man, when Paul talks about it, it's good. In this passage, Paul is somehow trying to convey to the Romans who they are in Christ. He's trying to explain who we are. Look, you're, you're not unique, right? You're not the only ones who get tired. These, these last few months have been, they've been a lot. And people get tired. And they grow weary in well-doing. And so Paul is speaking. He's trying to remind them just who you are. Verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, he gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any, any charge? against those whom God has chosen. That's us. It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, and more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding. He's praying for us. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face, face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. He's quoting Psalm 44. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither life, death nor life, Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, I pray that today you would help me to share your word with your people. Father, I pray you would help me to be clear and concise. I pray, Father, that you would speak through me today encourage your church in Jesus name amen so like Paul see I want to encourage you today in who you are in Christ I want to I want to try to build you up in who you are in Christ as you as you grow weary in the things that surround you see sometimes we forget we're not the underdog America loves a good underdog you are not the underdog I, I wish I wished I could get that through to you. You are not the underdog. In fact, you are quite the opposite. You are his church. You are a standard. He is raising up in the earth today. When the enemy comes in, the Lord raises up a standard. Could that standard be the church? Men and women sold out to him? You're a royal priesthood. A holy nation. A special possession, God's own special possession. Once, once you are not a people. Today, you're a people. You're the people of God. Once, once you were slaves, you're not slaves anymore. In fact, you're the people who have received His mercy. So you were once a people outside of His mercy, but today you're in His mercy. And more than that, you are people who are equipped to share that same truth with other people so they can be in His mercy too. It's amazing. You are called His body. You are those who are sold out to Him. People who have made a choice. The church is unquestionably the standard He is raising up in the earth today. And, and i got to tell you, nobody likes it. And nobody's happy about that. How, how do I express to you who you actually are in Christ? How, how, do I help you, how do I help you understand the place of authority that you as a Christian hold? The truth is, I just I, words are inadequate. I don't have the words to express to you who you are. A lot of this comes by revelation. If I, if I could convey to you that out of all of God's created beings, the angels, the angels that fell, Lucifer, mankind, you are the only ones to whom the blood of Jesus was given. No other being received that. No other being possesses that. You are his special possession. You are precious to him. You, you are, you are important to him. Now, for us, the blood is, the blood is many things, right? The, the, the blood is our, it's our forgiveness. It is a sign of us being forgiven by what he, what he's done. It, it is a protection for us. When you go out into the battlefield and your enemy rises up, the blood of Jesus is a protection for me. The blood of Jesus is also a weapon. And it's a weapon that can only be wielded by men. No other, no other being has this weapon. It wasn't given to any other being. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him. They defeated him. They beat him by the blood of the Lamb. And the testimony, the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even unto death. Friends, you are by no means 
the underdog in this battle of realms. Heaven is struggling. Earth is struggling. And you are not this poor little person over in the corner hoping everything comes out. I wish you could understand this. We are, we are, you are overcomers. And yet, we're made as the lowliest of beings. Right? I mean, we're made from the dust. The dust of the earth. So, while we are lowly, we are about to be exalted to the right hand of Christ. We're about to be exalted to heaven. You're about to be glorified. No other being can say that. The angels are not about to be glorified to a higher position. You get this, right? Do you think the devil's going to be glorified to a better position? He's going down. We are in a very unique place. Now, I, I want to show you something real quick. It's a complete rabbit trail, but I want you to understand it. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. There's time short, so I'm just going to read it. You can turn there if you want. You, but you know it. When I read it, you'll know it. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? I don't know if you can get it, but see, the earth could never, ever be his throne. And the reason is it can't bear up under the weight of his glory. He could put his feet on it. It can manage to be a footstool, but it could never hold the weight of his glory. It would collapse under the weight of his glory. And so... The heavens are his throne. And the earth is simply a footstool. Yet within that footstool, he has placed you. And within you, he placed his Holy Spirit. He placed him in you. He placed that glory in you. The earth is powerless to stand up under the weight of his glory. And yet you contain it. I don't know, get your head around that. You, you remember, you remember the, the man whom the legion of demons was cast out of? See, Jesus comes to this man and, and, and in him is what's uh, called legion. That means there were a lot of demons in this man. And, and as they begin to negotiate with Jesus, I mean, we all negotiate with him. He says, do this and we start negotiating. Demons are negotiating. They say, send us into the pigs. I want you to understand something. That was simply a miscalculation on their part. It was just a misunderstanding. See, they presumed that because one man could hold all of them, certainly a herd of pigs should be able to hold us. And yet when they were cast out into the herd of pigs, the pigs went nuts, ran down the embankment, drowned in the, in the water. See, pigs were not designed to contain the Spirit of God. They can't contain that kind of glory. But men were specifically designed to contain the Spirit of God Himself. He made you that way. He built you that way. And yet you walk around like an underdog. Oh, Pastor, you just don't understand what I've faced. Stop! I'm not being mean. Stop! Get your head around what's going on. You, you have not faced a trial to the point of death. You haven't, you haven't reached a point where you shed your own blood for what you're walking through, like many of your brothers and sisters have. A little perspective is, I think, in order as we go through these things. See, we, we say, we, we say I, need, I need more faith. I need more power. What you really need is more endurance. That's really what we need. See, what we need is that peace within us that when the struggle comes, we can say like Paul, these afflictions, they're light and they're momentary. We don't feel that way when it happens. We feel like our world's coming apart. Paul, Paul calls them light. Let's just read it. It's in, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 16. Paul says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, 
Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory, there's that word again, that far outweighs them all. Do you understand? It far outweighs all of your troubles, this glory. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen, that's eternal. Jesus, he's trying to explain this to the people, and he uses the analogy of childbirth, and it's a, it's a great analogy. He's trying to relate this idea of momentary afflictions. I've never, I'm a guy. I've just never understood it, right? My wife had a baby. I would never do that again. One time, I'm cured. <laughs> it's not going to happen again. And yet, Jesus says, after the child's born, she forgets the pain. Well, she must because they have more kids. And yet I'm in the room with her, and she's bending my hand all the way backwards, and I'm starting to wince in pain. She remembered it then. I want you to understand something. There is a joy of the child being born. There is a, there's a great joy of the child being born, and because of that, all the other things are put aside. Now, most childbirth isn't a 15-minute process. Most childbirth runs into hours. Some of them run into many hours. And for most women, this is an intense pain. This is not a, a light, momentary affliction. It is a long, drawn-out, painful affliction. And the term delivery comes from being delivered of my baby. I don't know if you know that, but that's pretty much it. See, if it was left up to us guys, the whole race would die out. Right? <laughs> I'd tell five or six of you what just happened. You go, yeah, I ain't into that. Everybody, we'd all be gone. I want you to understand his analogy, though. The woman, the woman will suffer pain, an intense time of labor and work and struggle and all these things for, let's say, 15, 20 hours. I mean, that's, that's kind of a long one. But the child, how long is the child going to live? 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, far past the parent. See, on the scale of the child's lifetime, a few hours, less than a day, really becomes almost insignificant. And this is the same analogy. The struggles you go through today, though they last months, though they last years, on the scale of eternity, kind of irrelevant. It doesn't mean they don't hurt. It doesn't mean they're not painful. It doesn't mean that they're heartbreaking when they happen. But on the scale of eternity, they're light and they're momentary. They move along quickly. Now, most of the church doesn't need more power. Most of the church doesn't need more faith. Most of the church needs to learn how to endure. You know, when you're in the middle of having birth, you can't go, you know what, hang on, this is not what I signed up for, and leave. They don't let you do that. Once you start, you're, you're committed. I'm just saying, that's how it works. You know how you learn endurance? There's only one way. You have to endure. That is the only possible way. And, and guys, I'm sorry. I, look, I don't make the rules. Endurance is only something you can learn in the valley. We all want to be on the mountaintop with Jesus and happy, and I. me too. Me too. But you don't learn endurance on the mountaintop. You learn endurance in the valley. Today, what little time I have left, I want to try to share with you. I want, I want to show you what endurance looks like, what real endurance actually looks like. Turn to uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. 
most of you know John was written, uh, was given by Jesus, but written down by John. And so in the first chapter of Revelation, John is explaining what happened, where he's at, and what's about to happen. So it's just kind of an introduction to this book that is, uh, well, it's heady. Chapter Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in tribulation, the kingdom, and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. I'll just stop there. What I want to do is I want to break down just those couple of passages for you and help you understand what he's communicating. In order to do that, I've got to give you a little bit of background. John penned Revelation somewhere around 95 A.D. As some people disagree, but most people agree it was somewhere around 95 A.D. that he wrote the book. The great fire of Rome that happened in 64 A.D. So at that point, Paul was alive and uh, Nero was the Caesar in Rome. Shortly after the great fire, the Apostle Paul was put to death. And then right after that, in 68, Nero commits suicide. So he is succeeded by Emperor Domitian. Now, the Apostle John was the last of the apostles picked out by Christ. All the others at this point in history have all been martyred. He's the last one of them. And sometime after Domitian's rise to power, he arrests John. And, and John is arrested. See, at that point in time, they did a lot of Caesar worship. And if you wouldn't worship Caesar... Well, bad things happen to you. And they lined that up with the same day as the days Christians would worship. So they didn't want Christians worshiping. They wanted Caesar to be worshipped. So John's arrested because he won't worship Caesar. And what you may not know about Domitian, we may not even know about Nero. Nero was a vile man. He was, he was an evil, wicked man. Nero would coat Christians in oil and light them on fire and use them to light up his dinner parties. Domitian was far worse than Nero. I don't even know how you get your head around that. So Domitian has arrested John and as a punishment for not worshiping him, worshiping the Caesar, the sentence is he's going to be boiled in oil. Think French fry dropped in the hot grease. That's his punishment. Now, unfortunately for Domitian, it didn't take. I, I don't know what happened. It's like the oil was hot, he was in there, nothing was happening. He didn't die. He didn't suffer anything. I just got to tell you, that must have got Domitian's attention. <laughs> It's like, dang, what do we do now? Well, I don't know what you do now. I don't think Domitian knew what we do now. And so he banished John to the island of Patmos. Now, we don't know how old John was when he was banished to Patmos, but he was well into his 80s when he wrote Revelation, when he penned the book. We don't know fully Domitian's purpose for sending him to Patmos. It could have been he was just afraid of John and thought, you know, that dude, we've got to get him as far away as possible. It could be that he thought, you know what, the oil didn't take, but I bet an old man breaking rocks in the sun. Yeah, I mean, you take an old man, put him at the bottom of a mine shaft, that's got to take a few days off his life. See, Patmos was a, it was a small island, but it was a mining island. And it is where they sent the, the prisoners that were the worst of the worst. The people they didn't really know what to do with. The, the kind of guys the devil doesn't want to hang out with because they're a little sketchy. They went, they went to Patmos. And what they did, Patmos was a forced labor camp. So 
you would be breaking rocks in the hot sun. And, and you're talking about a man somewhere in his mid to late 80s breaking rocks in the sun. Even in his last years. Now it's with this in mind. It's with this background. I want to reread Revelation 1.9. I, John, your brother, he was the last of the apostles. He was the last one left living. And that meant that he would have been really a leader to the church. He, he would have been the last of them. And what he's saying is, I am in no higher position. I do not consider myself in a higher position. I have not elevated myself to a position above you. I am simply a fellow servant. And then he goes on, and partner in tribulation. Now, the Greek word used here for tribulation means a heavy load, an unbearable load, something that is just about that much outside what a human can carry. And he says, I'm a partner with you in this as he's writing, because he knows that all the people that are going to read this are also suffering terribly because of the name. What he's saying is, I know you're experiencing it, and I'm experiencing it too. I didn't get a pass because of my position. I didn't get a pass because of my age. And I want you to understand it was important for him to write this way. He removed all stigma of his position to the church. Those who want to worship Christ, those who have set their hearts on these things, tribulations come. I, and and I want you to understand what he's saying as he's writing this. All I have to do is simply worship Caesar. All he has to say, you know what, dude, change my mind. Yep, I'm good. Let's go ahead and get that worship thing going. And he's out, freed from Patmos. All he has to do is worship Caesar. And he says this. He says, I'm not getting a pass because of my position. I'm not getting a pass for what I'm saying. And the, and the simple truth is, I don't even want to pass. I'm happy to be here. I am, I am, by not worshiping Caesar, I'm choosing to be here. I wouldn't have it any other way. Imagine how encouraging that should have been for the other brothers. Not, not because he's suffering, but because they're suffering. And if an old man can be standing up in this fashion, by golly, I ought to be able to do it too. It should, it should start to charge my faith somewhere along the lines. And yet, John's still not done with his introduction. Hi, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom. Why mention the kingdom? Why at this point bring up the kingdom? That was the very reason he was there. That was the only reason he was there. This was his most important identity of all. See, the world had marked him as a troublemaker. The world saw him as, as a problem. But what he is saying, I'm a son of the risen Christ. I'm a child of the risen Christ. This isn't about me. It never was about me. It's about what I represent. It's about who I represent. And then he continues. And the patient endurance that are in Jesus probably the hardest of all the statements he makes in this passage. And it's hard to get your head around. Again, he chose to be there. All he had to do was worship. That's all he had to do, and he was out. I'm not going to bow my knee. I'm not going to change my mind. And I'll be here as long as I, I am here. I want to tell you a secret, friends. If you'll learn to endure, you'll never lose. You don't lose when you endure. See, what happens is we're faithful for a minute and then we quit and we don't see the prize. Just be faithful to the end. Then you see the prize. And then he goes on. He begins to explain why he's actually on the island itself. They would have all known what Patmos was. He says, I was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Does this seem fair to you? An old man 
that the bottom of a mine shaft breaking rocks. Does that seem fair to anybody? Does that seem good to anybody? Was this a righteous judgment? Was he getting God's best? Doesn't seem like it to me. You ever get mad at God? How could you let this happen? I turned around for two minutes and my whole world falls apart. Where were you at? How did you let the devil get in? What did I do wrong? How did I get this wrong? Why is God doing this to me? I'll tell you something. Questions don't change anything. You can question all day long. You can change anything. And I'll tell you another thing. If he were to come down from heaven, part the skies, and answer your question, it still wouldn't change anything. The answers don't change anything. The only thing that changes anything is how you respond in that moment. That's the only thing that changes it. If he explained to you why you were suffering like this, does that remove you from the suffering? Not if you want the endurance. This, this is what Job learned. How you respond in that moment proves the metal that's within you. How, how you respond when the world around you disintegrates, determines the metal that's in you. I can say it as well with my soul. When everything is gone, so, how does John respond? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, surprisingly, the Lord's Day was also the day of Caesar worship. He wasn't worshiping Caesar on the Lord's Day. I was in the Spirit. And you'll notice that's capital S. I want to be clear about this. He, he in the midst of backbreaking hardship, in the midst of a completely unfair turn of the dice, in a completely out of his hands situation, he'd probably go, you know what? I wish the oil had just taken. I'd have been done by now. That would have been a momentary affliction. Now, I'm, this is much worse. And he's not in the little s. He's not in his spirit. He's not trying to muster his spirit up. Big s. I'm in the spirit. I am resting in God. I'm, I'm letting Him refresh me and renew me and refill me. I am, I am worshiping Him in the midst of all that's going around me. He's feeding off the Father, renewing His heart in the Lord. See, He hadn't let the pressure of life come between Him and Christ. As long as the pressure remains outside you and Christ, when it comes, it's just going to push you all together. That's good. But if the pressure comes between you and him, it'll press you apart. Don't let the pressure in there. Just keep it on the outside. He began to focus not on his situation, but he began to focus on the one who overcame all situations. And it was from that position. It was from the position of standing up under a great hardship and not thinking about himself, but putting his focus on the Father. Very next thing you read is, I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet saying, write down what you see. In this, in this moment, John had, had completely slipped out of this realm and he slipped into the next one. Just slipped on over. People sometimes ask me, how do I get in the secret place of the Most High? Like that. Stop focusing on your problems. Stop wasting all your mental energy on what's going wrong. Simply focus on Him. I hope you hear me today. You don't need more faith. You don't need more power. What you need, what you have great need of, what I have great need of is endurance. And there's only one way you get that. Enduring. That's the only way. You cannot learn on the mountaintop what is only taught in the valley. We don't like the valley. The valley comes and we just, I ain't going in there. I ain't doing that. We need to, we need to change our minds about the valley. We do. 
He'd be like James who said, count it pure joy. Does anybody count it pure joy when you look at the face of the valley? No, no, we don't. But friends, that's where you learn how to use your weapons. That's where you become a weapon. It's in the valley. You, you enter the valley with a sword that you can barely lift and an edge that couldn't hurt anybody. But you come out of the valley with an edge that's razor sharp. And you're not just dragging the sword, you're wielding it. Something happens in the valley. We, we enter the valley just hoping we're going to survive the experience. We enter the valley hoping the enemy doesn't see us. He might find me in here. And if he finds me in here, I'm in trouble. You enter the valley like that, thinking that he is a threat to you. And you leave the valley understanding you are always the threat to him. He's posturing and making all this noise because he knows who you are. You don't yet. You figure out who you are, everything begins to change. We, we enter the valley thinking we're trying to survive the onslaught of the devil. And the truth is, he's stuck in the valley hoping he can survive the onslaught of us. And the longer you stay in that valley, the more lethal you become. I told you before, you're not locked in a dark room with him. He's locked in the room with you. And friends, that's a very, very different thing. It's a very different thing. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. They triumphed over him by the blood. They didn't, they didn't sneak by without his notice. They walked in and took him out by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. This is John on the island of Patmos. Listen to me. No other created being possesses the weapons you possess. No other created being has been given them. Man alone has been given the blood of Christ. And you need to understand, because we are the only ones with it, we are the only ones who can wield it. We are the only ones. You play a role in what's happening. If you can get your head around that, and if you can learn endurance. If you can learn what the valley has to teach you, everything's going to begin to change. Your warfare will begin to change. Your battles will begin to change. Your interface with the devil will begin to change. You won't cower in the corner anymore because you'll begin to understand what God has done for you. I wish I could help you to understand this. While you may be struggling today, you may be striving against the devil, the real truth is he's the one who's struggling against you. That's the real truth. And he's doing his best to keep you as in the dark as possible because when you figure out what's going on, you will decimate him. It won't even be a battle. I want, you, I want you to see who you are. I want you to understand that when you call on the blood of Jesus, you're calling on something you alone have been given the right to. Angels don't have that. Demons don't have that. The devil doesn't have that. And so to think that we play no part in what's happening and what's going on around us is naive. You play a critical role. And without you playing your role, I'm not sure it works out. In this passage, in this battle of Revelation 12, 11, it only works out when the, when the angels take their place and men take their place. Today's the day to learn how to use the weapons. Today's the day to learn how to, how to hide in the secret place of the Most High. Hide in the secret place. Come out, take his legs out from under him, and go right back. <laughs> Come on. You're fighting a defeated foe is what I'm trying to tell you. It's time for us to rise up and be the church. Hallelujah.
Father, I pray today that you would help us to just see who we are in Christ. Father, somehow help us to embrace the people you have called us to be in this hour. Father, I pray for my friends who are here. Father, and I pray for those who are, who are really up against the ropes. Father, who are struggling in their walk, who are struggling in their battle. Father, I pray that you would restore them. I pray, Father, you'd strengthen their hearts and encourage them in this hour. I pray, Father, you'd show them how to hide in the secret place of the Most High. Father, I pray you'd show them how to use a sharp sword instead of a dull one. I pray, Father, you'd show them how to wield the sword instead of just carrying it as dead weight with them. Father, I pray that you would help us to come out of the valley as lethal weapons in your army. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, if you have your communion, listen, you possess promises nobody else has. You have promises no other created being has. i say it again because you're not getting it. You have promises nobody else has. They don't have them. Your promises are based on a covenant. What you hold in your hand is the ring of that covenant. This is the promise itself. This is why, this is why Paul said, don't take this lightly. He said, some of you are taking that and you're getting sick because you're taking it in an unworthy manner. Friends, if there's sin in your heart, just real quick, Father, forgive me. I just, whatever junk's in my heart, it's yours. I don't want it anymore. Forgive me, Father. If, if you're holding a grudge against somebody, lay it down right now. Father, I just, it's canceled. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not into that anymore. If your brother holds something against you, repent. Repent. And the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Let's receive it together. Thank you, Jesus. And after the meal, he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Friends, there is no covenant ever without blood. Blood is always required for a covenant. It was in his blood this covenant was cut. Let's receive it together. Thank you, Jesus, for your covenant. Hallelujah. It's time for the church to stop walking around like the underdog. Yeah. In heavenly armor, we enter the land. The battle belongs to God. Praise the Lord. Have an awesome week. If there's something I can do for you, I'll be up here. The prayer team will be up here. Have a great week.